Hey friends, what's up? Welcome back to Babel on Talmud. Today we're studying Daf Kuf Nun Gimel of Masech the Shabbos, Daf 153. Yeah, great Daf today. Well, the Daf starts off kind of um, finishing up with those Agatatas related to death. Um, then we begin the um, 24th and final parak of Masech the Shabbos. The um, parak of Misha Hichshich. Um, and we are mostly going to talk about what happens if you're traveling on Friday afternoon and it gets dark. What do you do? And then as part of that towards the end, well, kind of throughout, but also towards the end, we're going to talk about sort of making sure that your animals rest on Shabbos and the halachos um, and implications of that. Friends, let's get started. We're going to start on the Kuf Nun Beis. Amud Beis, four lines from the bottom. Amle Yaumina Rabbi Abo. So certain min said to Rabbi Abo, Amrisu Nishmasun Shel Tzadikin Gnuzis Tachas Kisei Hakovid. So this min, which we have been um, saying, or at least I've been saying, is possibly like an early Christian kind of fellow, and he says to Rabbi Abo, he says, so you rabbis say that the souls of tzaddikim kind of hang out beneath the um, honorable throne of God. So this min wanted to know, but if that's the case, well then Shmuel, right? It says that Shaul went to a pra- a witch and asked her to bring up the spirit of Shmuel. So the Gemara, so this min wanted to know how could this um, this uh, witch have brought have summoned the soul of Shmuel if he was chilling darting by under the Kisei Akavot, right? I guess I guess the assumption being that it makes more sense to say you know if he's just lying there in the ground, so then maybe she could bring him up. But if he's like Mamish right under God's throne, well, I guess that would be a more complicated mission. So Amrle, so Rabbi Bo answered, Hasam Besoch Shnemasa Chodesh Hava. Well, that story with Shaul and this witch was within twelve months after Shmuel's passing. And because it was within twelve months after Shmuel's passing, so the Tanya as we learn in Abraisa, Kol Yudbeis Chodesh Gufo Kayim Vnishmaso Olav Yoredes. That for the first twelve months the body remains intact and the soul is going up and down. After 12 months, so the body becomes batel, becomes nullified, and the soul just goes up to the heavens and then no longer comes down. And because um, Shaul visited this witch within uh, 12 months of Shmuel's death, so the soul was still kind of coming up and down, and I guess it was more accessible from a sorcery uh, standpoint. And that is why this witch was able to summon the soul of Shmuel. However, once uh, after 12 months, so then the soul kind of goes up to the Kisei HaKovid, in the case of Shmuel at least, and it then doesn't go anywhere. Okay. Um, Rav Yehuda Breda of Shmuel Bar Shilas Mishmed Rab. It says Rav Yehuda, the son of Shmuel Bar Shilas, in the name of Rab. What does he say? May I speak to Shaladim Nicker and Beno Olam Habahu Imlab? So from a person's eulogies, you can tell if he is uh, a person destined for the world to come, for Olam Haba, right? So if the eulogies are really good and people are responding properly and crying and you know it's a very moving experience so then you can tell that this person who passed away uh, is destined for olam haba ini one second is this really true did rav really say this but one second rav said to rav shmuel bashilas you know give me a good geshmaka eulogy make sure that everybody cries because I'm going to be there and I'm going to be listening. So I want you to make sure it's a very stirring 
ceremony, very stirring funeral. So now the kasha is this. If Rav, in fact, said that based on a person's, sort of organically, based on a person's um, eulogies and the response of the mourners to the eulogies, you could tell if a person is destined for the world to come, meaning that somebody who is destined to the world to come, you can be sure that he's going to have a very stirring funeral and stirring eulogies. Well, why did Rav therefore have to feel the need to say to Shmuel Bar Shilas, make sure that I have a very stirring funeral? I mean, if people who are destined to the world to come, and the assumption is that Rav was surely destined to the world to come, well, if people destined to go to the world to come will have a stirring funeral, well, then Rav obviously will have a stirring funeral. So why did he have to ask Rosh Mubar Shilas to make sure that he's a stirring funeral. Of course he's going to have one. After all, he's certainly destined to go to Olam Abba. So my answer is, Lo kasha had v'achim, had v'lo'achim. So the Gemara answer is, well, it kind of depends. Apparently Rav was um, already an old man when he passed away. And therefore it's, it's you know, it's, it, it's sort of, I guess, an added, uh, an added challenge. Meaning, you know, when a person passes away, I guess at, at a younger age, well then, it's, it, in addition to the fact that it's sad that he passed away, it's also tragic. And therefore, it's much, I guess it's, it's more natural to be stirred. And therefore, it can't, you know, and therefore based on how stirring the funeral was, you could tell if this person was a Ben Olam Abba or not. However, when a person passes away, when he's um, older, such as Rav was, well, while it's sad that he passed away, it's not necessarily tragic and it will be much more difficult to stir the people. And therefore, because Rav was passing an, at, at an old, passing away at an older age, so that's why he felt the need to ask of Shmuel um, Bar Shilas to make sure that it was a stirring funeral because people wouldn't, uh, people were sort of less susceptible, less open to really being distraught over it since after all, he lived a full life and he lived a good life. Interesting. So basically, um, so when Rob says that, that based on a person's funeral, you could tell if he's destined to the world to come, that would be, I guess, somebody who passes away before they would be considered already old. And um, at that point, so if the people are stirred, so then this person, you could tell, was a Ben Olam Abba. If not, so then, I don't know, maybe yes, maybe no. But uh, once a person is older, it's already, you know, we need a little bit more of a push, even if the person is destined to be a Ben Olam Abba. Interesting. Amalei Abai the Rabba. It says Abai to Rabba. Kigon mar disanulei kulu pumpedisai. Isn't that interesting? So Abai says to Rabba, Rabba, it's no secret that all of the people, that you're not very popular in Pumpedisa. Rab, of course, was the Rosh Hashiva in Pumpedisa, and I guess he would give them a lot of Musr, and he wasn't necessarily uh, so well loved. And therefore, Abai said, No, Rabba, what are you going to do? Who's going to cry at your funeral? So, Man Achim. So, who's going to get the people to cry? So, Rabba says, So, Man Achim Espeda. So, Amalei, Mistaya At, Rabba Bar, Rav Chanon. So, Rabba says, Well, I'm kind of. Abai, that's where you and Rabba and Rabba Bar Chanan come in. That I'm relying upon you to stir up the people to cry at my funeral. Okay. Ba Mine Rabbi Elazar me Rab. So Rabbi Elazar asked from Rab, Ezu ben Olam Abba. So Rabbi Elazar asked from Rab, who is a person destined to the world to come? Destined for the world to come. Omrle. So Rav responded, that your ears, it's, it's a pasuk in um, Yeshaya, that your ears will hear something from behind you. Lamor to say, this is the way to walk, this is the way to live life. If you go right or go left, meaning if, if, if you hear, if after you die, you then hear the people talking about you and saying, wow, this person lived a really, an exemplarily an exemplary life. Other people should go on that same path and live a similar life. Well, then you know that you did something right 
right, and that you are a you are destined to the world to come. Rabbi Chanina Amar said, Rabbi Chanina, Kol Shedas Rabosav Nocha Heimenu, a person whose teachers Shep Nachis from him, person whose teachers say, um, Wow, you know, this person really made something of himself. Well, then uh, that person is destined for the world to come. Okay. V'savu Bashuk Hasoftim. So now back to the twelfth parak of uh, Koheles. So it says that the that the um, eulogizers will eulogize, will 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 will, will go around in the market. Bnei Galila Amre Asedvarim Lifnei Mitascha. Bnei Yehuda Amre Asedvarim Leachar Mitascha. So in the Galilee, they would say, you know, eulogize before the coffin, whereas in Yehuda, they would say eulogize after the coffin, Vlopligae, it's no argument really, Markiasu, Markiasu, it just depends what the minig was. That in the Galil, the eulogizers would stand before the coffin, like in front of it, and in Yehuda, they would stand behind it. So that's all they were saying, but they were um, really just saying the same thing, I guess, to eulogize a person who passed away. It's not awesome. We learn over there in Pirkei Ovis. Rabbi Eliezer, Omer says, Rabbi Eliezer, Shuv Yom Echad Lefnei Misascha. You should um, do tshuva one day before you die. Shalu Tamida Vis Rabbi Eliezer. Now, Rabbi Eliezer's students asked him the obvious question. V'chi Adam Yodea Ezeu Yom Yomus. Does a person know what day he's going to die on, that the day before he can do tshuva? Omer Layan, so Rabbi Eliezer responded, No, he doesn't. V'choshachain, v'choshachain, and therefore, because a person doesn't know what day precisely he's going to die, so therefore, um, you should do, right, um, you should do tshuva today, because you don't know if tomorrow you might die. And then it turns out that all of your days were doing tshuva, right? Meaning every single day you should be doing tshuva, because who knows, you might die tomorrow, and therefore, this is the day you should be doing tshuva. And then tomorrow you do tshuva, because maybe the day afterwards you'll die. Therefore, you should always be doing tshuva, um, and that way you'll always be ready. Also, Shlomo said in Koheles, that at every time your clothes should be white. And you should not lack oil on your head. Right? So you should always, right? I think the focus at this point, uh, is that your clothing should always be white, i.e. you should always be doing tshuva so that if you do end up dying the next day, um, you will die in a good in a good state. So Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai says that this is like a parable to a king, that he uh, invited all of his servants to come to a banquet. But he didn't tell them when this banquet is going to take place. So the wise among them, well, they got dressed, got ready for the banquet, and they sat and they waited outside of the palace of the king because they said, look, after all, the king has everything he needs. Surely on a whim, he can create a banquet. He has all the food he needs. He has all the servants he needs. All the wine he needs, everything that he needs, he has already. So obviously, he didn't tell us when the banquet's going to be, but Mistama, it's now. And the foolhardy among them, they thanked the king for the invitation and then went to go do their work because they said, look, the mice, it's going to take some time, some time to prepare this banquet, right? So they went to go do their work. And guess what happened, friends? Pison bikesh amelech savadov. And then suddenly the king says, okay, banquet starts now. Well, well, the wise among them who had already prepared themselves for the banquet and were waiting outside while they showed up to the banquet, as they should, in their finest, ready for a nice, lavish banquet. Vatipshim, whereas the foolhardy among them, nichnesu lefanov kshen meluchlachen, um, they showed up at the banquet dirty. Uh oh. So Machamelech likras pikchim, v'chos likras tipshim. So the king was very happy about the smart people and very angry about the foolish people. 
Omar, he said, Halalu shekishtu es atzman suda. These fellows who adorned themselves for the banquet, yeshvu v'yochlu v'yishtu, they should sit, they should eat, they should drink, enjoy themselves l'maysa. Halalu shelo kishtu atzman suda. But these fellows who did not prepare themselves for the banquet, yamdu v'yiru, they should stand and observe like a bunch of nebuchs. Chasan of Reb Meir, Mishum Reb Meir Amar, the son-in-law of Reb Meir, said in the name of Reb Meir, Af hein nirin kimshamshin. So, no, they can't just stand there watching, because if these um, foolish people stand there watching, it'll look like they're just waiters, like they're working there, like they're supposed to be there. And the point is that we want to make them feel real bad. So, Ela, Elu elu Yoshvin, Halalu Ochlum, Valalu Reven. Rather, no, both the um, wise people and the foolish people are sitting at the same tables, but um, the wise people are eating while the foolish people are not and they are sitting there hungry. Halalu Shosen, Valalu Tzmeim. The wise people are drinking and the foolish people are thirsty. Shinemar, the Pasuk says, Koyama Hashem, so said God. Hine Avada Yochelu. My servants will eat, va'atem tiravu, and you will be hungry. In avada yishtu, my servants will drink, va'atem titzmo, and you will be thirsty. In avada yoronu, my servants will rejoice, mituv lev, out of good hearts, va'atem titzaku, mikeiv lev, and you're going to cry out from pained hearts. Wow. All right. Sounds like the foolish people are not really going to enjoy that banquet very much. Okay. Dover acher. Okay. So that was that. Um, kind of parable about doing tshuva and we said that in understanding the pasuk in Kohelis so we learned from there that you should do tshuva every single day now the Ra'achar a different way to understand that pasuk is that at every time your clothing shall be white Elu Tzitzis this is a reference to Tzitzis V'shem Arosh Chal Yechsar Elu Tfilin and you should not lack oil on your head that is Tfilin Hadron Alach Sho'el we will come back to you, Perek Shoel. Friends, we now begin the 24th and final Perek of Masech Shabbos. Mishihichshich baderech nosen kiso l'nochri. So if you have a fellow, and he's traveling on Friday afternoon, and it's getting dark, so what does he do? He's, he's, you know, he's carrying his wallet, at least. What does he do? He's, he's in Rishus Harabim somewhere, in between Yanimsvelt and uh, Chvaisnisht. And it's uh, it's going to be Shabbos. And he can't carry, of course, over there. So what does he do? So the Mishnah suggests that he can give his uh, wallet to the non-Jewish person who he's traveling with. Okay. But what if he doesn't have a non-Jewish person with him? So he can put it on his donkey. And now, if he shows, now once he gets to town, and he gets to the first chatzer, the first courtyard there in town, so no tell us a kalim, and he tell him Shabbos, and then goes to his donkey, and whatever uh, things that he had on his donkey that are not muksa, that are muhan, things that he's allowed to move on Shabbos, so then he takes them off of the donkey. Vishainan, he tell him Shabbos. And the items that are muktzah that are not allowed to be moved on Shabbos, matir achavalim v'hasakin v'hasakin noflin me'elim. Well, then you can just untie the um, ropes that are that are tying the sacks to the donkey, and the sacks will just fall on their own since he can't move these items himself. He can just let them fall off the donkey. Okay, says the Gemara. My time Shaul Rabban the Mace of Kisei the Nachri. How come the rabbis allowed this fellow to give his wallet to a non Jew? Because after all, we generally do not allow non Jewish people to do malacha for us on Shabbos. Right? Midrabana. Right? Midrabana. The rabbi said that you can't that a non Jew is not allowed to do malacha for a Jew on Shabbos. How come in this situation we suggest that the Jew give his wallet to the non-Jew to carry for him before Shabbos begins. So the Gemara answers, Kim Lulu Abanan, because these same rabbis who said 
that a Jew may not request from a non-Jew to do malacha for him, they also realized that a person is not just going to stand idly by while he loses his money. He's got a wallet full of hard-earned money. Maybe he was traveling for business. He's been away for a while. Who knows? You know, all the, his hard work went into that wallet. So he's not just going to like drop it on the floor and forget about it. And And if you don't give him some way to enable him to continue traveling with his wallet until he gets to where he's going... Right? And in this case, if you don't allow him to give it to the non-Jew to carry for him, well, then he's just going to carry it himself. He's definitely not leaving it there wherever he is. So therefore, the same rabbis who said that you are not allowed uh, to have a non-Jew do malacha for you on Shabbos, they also said that in this case, when it has to do with significant financial loss, you would be allowed to give your wallet to the non-Jew to have him carry it for you. On my Rava, Davka kisa abametziyalo says Rava, but now this applies only to his wallet. But if he found something, he wouldn't be able to set to ask the non-Jew to uh, carry that for him. Okay, pshita. The Gemara says, well, Rava, that's obvious. Kiso tanan. After all, it does say his wallet, and we could imply from there, yeah, his wallet he can give to a non-Jew, but nothing else. Ma'u de tema. So the Gemara says, yeah, but I may have thought to say who adin afilu. Mitziah. I may have thought that when the Mishnah says that he can give his um, wallet to a non-Jew, it's not only a wallet. A wallet is just an example of something that he can give to a non-Jew, but he can even give things that he found to a non-Jew as well. And when it says wallet, why does it say wallet? Because a wallet is something that is very common for a person to have with him. So therefore, the Mishnah used the example of wallet, but really it would it would it would um, extend to anything that he has, even things that he found. Kamash Malan, that is what Rava is coming to teach us, which is that, um, in fact, the Mishnah is only talking about a wallet. He would not be allowed to give something that he found to the non-Jew to carry for him on Shabbos. And additionally, um, when Rava is saying that He's only allowed to give his wallet to a non-Jew to carry for him, but not anything that he finds. That is only talking about things that he finds on Shabbos. Things that he finds on Shabbos, he wouldn't be allowed to have a non-Jew carry for him. However, if he found it before Shabbos and he made a Kenyan and it belongs to him already before Shabbos, well then it's just like his wallet and he'd be allowed to give it to the non-Jew to carry for him on Shabbos. Ikadam, are those who say that actually this last piece about finding it on Shabbos is actually not taken for granted. It's actually a question. Ba'i Rava, Rava wants to know, Metziah Abba li, Liado Mau. What, how do we treat something that he finds before Shabbos and makes a kinin on? Came into us Liado Kikise Dami. Since it came into his possession before Shabbos and he made a kinin on it, so it's like his wallet and he should be able to give it to a non-Jew to carry for him. Or Dilmor perhaps came into Lotar Achba Lav Kikise Dami. Or maybe we say that you know, unlike his wallet, which he worked really hard to make to earn that money, this is something that he posh had found. And therefore, since he just found it without any work that went into it, it's not like his wallet. And, you know, we're not concerned that if we don't let him give it to the non-Jew that he's, you know, he's, he's going to carry it himself, right? Since that's not a concern, then maybe he wouldn't be allowed to give it to the non-Jew. Uh, take and we actually don't know. So the first way of understanding Rava is that Rava says definitively that if this is something that he found, I mean, a Kinnanam before Shabbos, he would be able to give that to the non-Jew to carry for him, just like um, his wallet. The other way of, of, of doing it is that it's actually a question, which is in the event that he found this item before Shabbos and he made a Kinnanam before Shabbos, do we say that it's now like his wallet and he can give it to Nanju. Or do we say that, well, the fact of the matter is he didn't actually work hard and earn this thing that he found. So therefore maybe it wouldn't be considered like a, a like a wallet. And, and we say Teku, we don't, we don't resolve this question. Ein imonachri. So the Mishnah says that if there is no non-Jew, if he's not traveling with a non-Jewish person, well then, um, if he has, if he's traveling with a donkey, so then he can just take his wallet and put it on the donkey. Taima de ein imo nachriya yesh imo nachri le nachriya evle. So the Gemara says that now the reason why 
we say that he could put his wallet on his donkey is because there's no non-Jewish person with him. But if there is a non-Jewish person with him, better to put it, to, be, better to ask the non-Jewish person to carry it for him than to put it on his donkey. My time, how come? Because Chamerata Mutsuva al Shvisaso, Nachriata Mutsuva al Shvisaso, because after all, um, right, right, right. Uh, just like I have a chi of, of resting on Shabbos and not doing melacha, well, the same applies to my animals, right? As we're going to uh, get into soon, right? But it says, um, that it applies to your animals as well. And therefore, um, ideally, if I have the option to spare my donkey from carrying something on Shabbos, um, that would be preferred. And therefore, if, if, if I have an option to give this item to a non-Jewish person with me versus giving, uh, putting it on my donkey that I have a mitzvah to make sure that it has a day of rest, uh, I should prefer to give the item to the non-Jewish person. What if you have a chamer v'cheir shot v'kayin? What if you have a donkey, but you also have either a deaf person, a dumb person, or a child? What should you do? A chamer manach le l'cheir shot v'kayin lo yoiv so the answer is, prefer to put the item on the donkey rather than to give it to a cheresh, a shote, or a cotton. My time, how come? Hani adam, hai lav adam. So the answer is, well, um, cheresh, shote, a cotton are human beings, whereas uh, an animal is not a human being. And therefore, even though a cheresh, a shote, and a cotton may not have a chiyuv to do mitzvos, but there are other people who do have a chiyuv to do mitzvos, and therefore, since there are uh, people who have a chiyuv to do mitzvos, and therefore would not be allowed to carry on Shabbos, therefore, if we could prefer, you know, if we have the option to just put it on a donkey, which is in a completely separate category, there are no donkeys that are chayiv in mitzvos, there are no animals that are chayiv in mitzvos, even though I have a chiyuv to make sure that my animal rests, but still, um, I would prefer, uh, I should prefer to put this, uh, my wallet on the donkey where there's not going to be any animals that ever have a chiyuv or, in, or a lav not to carry on Shabbos. So, um, I, I should prefer to put the wallet on my donkey rather than to give it to, um, other human beings. Fine. Okay. Cheres shote. Okay. So cheres vishote. Now, what if it's between somebody who's deaf and somebody who's dumb? The shote. Give it to the shote. Shote v'katan, the shote. What if it's between somebody who is dumb and a... Meaning, and Rashi defines a shote as delays le das klal. He doesn't have any das at all. He doesn't have any knowledge, any understanding at all. So if it's between a um, shote and a katan, so um, prefer to give it to the shote. Okay. But they want to know what about between somebody who's deaf and a child. Who should you give it to? So So the Gemara says, okay, well, according to Rabbi Eliezer, it's clear uh, who you should give it to. And the answer is you should give it to the Katan. We're going to get there in a minute, but the answer is you should give it to the Katan. How come? Titania, as we learn in Abayi, Rabbi Yitzchak, Omer says Rabbi Yitzchak, Meshum Rabbi Eliezer. Okay, says Rabbi Yitzchak, the name of Rabbi Eliezer, Trumas Cheresh, Lo Seitzi Lechulin. So what happens if you have tevel? What happens if you have untied produce and a cheresh, a deaf person, uh, separates um, truma from this untied produce? So what happens with that truma? Is it considered good truma? Uh, or is it not? If the cheresh is allowed to separate truma, well then it'll be truma. If he's not, well then it's not truma. However, um, According to Rabbi Yezer, we don't, we, 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 Pasha don't know. He's considered a suffix. And we don't know if his truma is truma or not. And therefore, the solution, the only solution is that the person who owns the tevel needs to separate truma a second time. And that will be the truma. And that is what he will give to the Kohen. Um, um, and yeah, and we don't know what to do with this truma that was separated by the deaf person. So what do we see? So we see that a deaf person, according to Rabbi Ezer, is a suffix whether he has das, whether he, he doesn't. It's a suffix whether he's, uh, you know, he, he, if he separates truma, if it works or not. Whereas, 
A katan, certainly if a katan, if a child were to separate truma, it would not work. And therefore, we see that a katan doesn't have das at all, doesn't have any chiv mitzvahs at all. Whereas a cheresh, well, no, a katan has a little bit of, of, of das. However, he has no chiv and mitzvahs. Whereas over here, we seem to be besafik whether or not a cheresh has a chiv and mitzvahs. And therefore, if it's between a cheresh and a katan, at least according to Rabbi Yezer, prefer to give it to the katan. However, kitibay la chalibadarabanan. But where the, 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 the question really arises between a cherish and a katan is according to the Rabbanan. The Tanan, as we learn in the Mishnah, Chamisha lo Yisromu. There are five people who should not, um, separate truma. Vim tarmu en chumasan truma. And if they did separate truma, well, it doesn't work at all. And here they are. Eluen. These are them. Cherish shotifikain. Okay. So, a, Deaf person, a dumb person, and a child. So, so, if they separate truma, well then it doesn't work at all. If Ruvain goes into Shimon's field and separates truma for him without Shimon um, asking him to do so, well then it doesn't work. Now, if a non-Jew separates truma for a Jew, even with the Jew's permission, um, the truma doesn't work. So, new. So we see in this Mishnah that according to the Chachamim, so, Chere, Shota, and Katan, if they separate a Truma, it 100% does not work. Now, if that's the case, well, it sounds like a Chere, and a Katan are on the same level in terms of mitzvahs. So, who should I prefer to give it to if, if it's getting dark and I have a Katan and a Chere with me? Should I give it to the cotton or the cherish? Should I give my wallet to the cotton or to the cherish? So, my, what do we do? Do we say the cherish shayv? Do we say we'll give it to the deaf person? The cotton, right, the cherish shayv, lay the cotton, asi lichladas. Because we'd prefer to give it to the cherish, to the deaf person, because the deaf person, you know, doesn't have a chiv in, in mitzvahs. And, like, that's that. Unfortunately, he's never going to have a chiv in mitzvahs. However, this katan, while right now he doesn't have a chiv and mitzvah because he's young, but he'll grow up and he will have a chiv and mitzvah. So rather, right, so better to just kind of not, 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 not give him any wrong ideas, not have him be in a situation where he's carrying on Shabbos because after all, he's going to later be unable to carry on Shabbos when he gets older. So therefore, prefer to give it to the cheresh who never is going to be chiv and mitzvah. O Dilma, or perhaps, the katan yaivle, better to give it to the child, the cherish asi lachlufi begadu pikeach. Because if you say that the lach is that you should give it to this, uh, deaf person, well, you may end up giving it to another adult who isn't deaf, and who has a chiv in mitzvos, and that would be a problem. So who do we give it to? The katan or, or, or the, sh- or, or, or the cherish? So ikadami the cherish yaivle, ikadami the katan yaivle. Well, some people say give it to the, deaf person. Some people say give it to the child. So it, it it's inconclusive. Okay. What do you do if you're not traveling with any non-Jewish people? You're not traveling with a donkey. You're not traveling with a deaf person, with a dumb person, with a child. My. What do you do? You have your wallet. It's getting dark. Friday afternoon. What do you do? Summer Yitzchak Said Rabbi Yitzchak, or Acheres Haisa Vlorotsu Chacham Legalosa. So says Rabbi Yitzchak that there's, that there's actually another option that you can do, but the Chacham didn't want to mention it. My or Acheres Haisa, what is this option that the Chacham didn't want to mention? Molicho Pachus Pachus Midalad Amis. You can just keep on walking less than four Amis, because if you walk less than four Amis, well then you didn't do Havara. Right, you didn't you didn't walk something for Amis in Rosh Hashanah. You walked it less than four Amis, and you keep on walking less than four Amis. You're not ever going to be doing anything wrong, Mida Oraisa. Galosa. What was the problem with revealing this? Why did the Chacham not want to allow people to do this? Mishum the pasuk says, "Kvod Elokim Haster Daver." It is the honor of God to hide things. Kvod Melachim Chakor Daver. Where it is is the way of, 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 you know, human kings to kind of, um, measure things and show things off, right? God, it's his honor when things are hidden and concealed. But the, um, kings, it is his honor when things are revealed and people can see them. Okay. Over here, what, what, what is the honor of God that we are hiding by, by not 
telling people that they're allowed to carry something less than four amas at a time. Well, because we're concerned that if you tell people that they're allowed to walk as long as it's in increments of less than four amas at a time, well then they might end up walking four amas at a time and that would be a problem. So uh, in order to prevent that from happening, which would be sort of a violation of the honor of God, we, um, we, we, we say in order to preserve the honor of God, let us conceal this um, uh, halachic opinion. Okay. Tanya, we're learning a brisa. Rabbi Yehazar Omer Bo Bayom God Shusa. Rabbi Yoshua Omer Bo Bayom Macha Kusa. Wow. So this goes all the way back, all the way, all the way, all the way, all the way, all the way back, 140 pages ago. Tadaf Kuf Yud Gimel. No, we're not. No, 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 no. We're in, we're right now in Daf Kuf Nun Gimel, but this goes back to Daf Yud Gimel of Masechta Shabbos. Where we said that there were 18 things that they, that they decreed that day in the, uh, loft of Hanania ben Chizkiah ben Garum. And then Adaf Yud Zayin Amud Beis, it says that one of these things was exactly this halacha that we're learning right now. That somebody who gets dark while he's traveling, so he gives his wallet to a non-Jewish person. Um, that was one of the things that they decreed on that day. So now, there are different perspectives about what went on in that loft on that day. So says the Gemara, Tanya Rabbi Eliezer, Omer says Rabbi Eliezer, Bo Bayom God Shusa, on that day, when the work that they did in that loft on that day was mamish, um, very, very good. It's like they took a, a measure, a sa'a, and they had it overflowing and heaping. Rabbi Yeshua Omer, Bo Bayom Macha Kusa, whereas Rabbi Yeshua's perspective was the opposite. On that day, they mamish erased this measure. They mamish ruined this measure. Tanya, we learn in a brayso. Marshal the Rabbi the Mahadov Adome, the parable of the overflowing, heaping um, measure of Rabbi Eliezer. What is that similar to? The kupam leakishun udluin. It's like you have a box, and the box is filled with um, squashes, and I don't know. I feel like kishun is, is is a word that gets translated differently every time. But the art school this time said melons. I feel like last time it said cucumbers, but the point is that it's filled with these kind of big vegetables or fruits that there's also room that you can get smaller things in there as well. You can just pour in like a mustard seeds and there will be room for the mustard seeds as well because there's going to be lots of, you know, spaces between the gourds and the melons. And therefore, the point being that the gzeras that they made uh, in that loft were, you know, there's plenty of room for those gzeras. They helped Am Yisrael and they were, it was very good that they made them. Whereas, Mashal Rabbi Yeshua the Ma'adav Rabbi Yeshua's parable about, metaphor about the um, uh, measure that is erased, what is that similar to? La Reva Malea Dvash, it's like if you have a vat that is filled with honey. Nosin the Socho Rimonim Ve'egozim Vimakia. If you then um, add pomegranates and nuts, well then all of that honey that was in there is going to start, you know, like being vomited out of there. It's going to start oozing out of this vat and it, you know, the uh, initial content, you know, what you had originally starts getting lost. I Meaning according to Yeshua, right, it was like enough already. We don't need 18 extra gazeris. And what happens is when you add more gazeris, well then the, where you started with was the original mitzvahs, you know, people can't, you know, people just end up throwing up their arms and saying, look, we, we, we just can't do any of this. So according to Rabbi Eliezer, the gazeres that they made were very good. According to Rabbi Yeshua, um, he said, look, they were overkill and not helpful. Interesting. Omar Mar, we said earlier, En imo nachri manicho ala chamor. Okay, so we said earlier that if this person is traveling on Erev Shabbos and it's getting dark and he's got his wallet, so preferably if he's with a non-Jewish person, he can ask this person to carry it for him. If there is no non-Jewish person, so then he puts it on his donkey. Well, the question is, how does that fix anything? But at the end of the day, he is going to be leading his donkey. Um, and the Pasuk says that you're not allowed to do any malacha, you, and that includes your animals as well. So, so the Gemara wants to know, how, how come you would be allowed, how come the suggestion is to put the wallet on your animal? I mean, Sounds like Mido Araisa, your animal also needs to rest, and your animal can't carry this item. If I can't carry this item for Amas and Shusarabim, well, my, 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 my animal can't either. So, 
why is there the suggestion to put the wallet on the donkey? Amr of Adab Ahava Manicho Alea Kishihima Aleches. So of Adab Ahava suggests, suggests that um, you put the wallet on the donkey while it is walking. Okay? Now if the donkey is already walking, well then the donkey is not doing an Akira, right? You're only chayev for carrying something for Amas and Rishus Arabim if you do an Akira and a Hanacha. If I pick up something in Rishus Arabim, walk for Amas with it and then put it down, well then that is a uh, problem. However, um, you know, in this case, what's happening is, right, so just like I can't pick up something, walk for Amos and put it down, well then my donkey has the same, you know, uh, Havara is the same for myself and for my donkey. It's defined in the same way. Therefore, the donkey would be unable to, you know, essentially pick something up, carry it for Amos and put it down. How does the donkey pick something up? Well, when it starts moving, that's considered the Akira. When it stops moving, it's considered the Anacha. So, Rabbi, so if Adab Rahava's suggestion is, that, well, just have the um, donkey start walking and then place the wallet on the donkey's back. And therefore, the donkey isn't doing any Akira and then certainly, you know, you can't be violating the, the uh, you know, the, the idea not to, the malacha of not carrying something for Amos because he's not doing any Akira. Yeah, but eventually the donkey is going to have to stop to use the bathroom, in which case when he starts going again and then stops again, well, he's going to be doing an Akira and a Hanacha. So granted that maybe when you initially put the wallet on the donkey, the donkey was moving, but it's going to start and stop again. So, Vika Akira Vanacha, and there's going to be an Akira and a Hanacha. So the Gemara answers, omedes not lo imena. So the Gemara answer is, so what you do is, when the donkey is moving, you place the wallet on the donkey, so there's no Akira. And then when the donkey stops to use the bathroom, so then there's a Hanacha, sure, but there was no Akira. Now when the donkey is stopped, you then pick up the wallet. And then when the donkey starts walking again, you then put it back on the donkey while it's walking again. So basically, um, you know, you just got to kind of make sure that there's never going to be an Akira and a Hanacha on the part of the donkey. Very interesting. Yeah, if this is the case, well then I feel Well if this is the case, then why do I need a donkey? Why don't I just have my friend? Kilu, right? It's only a malacha on Shabbos if I pick up something, walk for Amos and put it down. If I do the Akira and the Hanacha. However, if I do the Akira and my friend does the Hanacha, so then it's okay to walk something more than for Amos. Well then why do I need a donkey? I can just have it with my, I can just do the same thing with my friend. So Amar of Papa, so her papa says, no. Anything that I do myself, if I do it myself, I'd be chayv a korban chatas, such as carrying something for Amos and Rishus Arabim. Well, if I split it with my friend, such as if I do the Akira and he does the Anacha, well then it will be pater aval aser. It will be aser midir abonon. However, something that if I split with my friend will be aser midir abonon, for my donkey to do it would be mutter l'chatkhila. And that is why better to do it with my donkey than with my friend because my donkey is going to be mutter. As long as the donkey is already moving and I put it on the donkey's back and therefore the donkey is not doing any akira, well then it's completely mutter. Whereas if I did the same thing with my friend, well then it would be, it would be also midir abonan. Amr vada bar ahava, haisa chavila su munachas lo akseifo. What if a person is wearing a backpack? What if a person is wearing a backpack and it's Friday afternoon and the sun is starting to go down and he's not yet back in his city. So, Ratz Tachtea Ajmagia Leveso. So, what he can do is he could start sprinting. He could start running and just run all the way home. And like that, he started running before Shabbat started. So when Shabbat started, he was already running. So there's never any Akira. And he's just running straight home. So therefore, um, you know, he's, he's never doing, you know, he's not, there's no Akira and Anacha for Amas. Okay, now the Gemara says, Davka Ratz, Ava Kali Kali Lo. So the Gemara says, now, specifically, we say he's allowed to run, but he wouldn't be allowed to just kind of walk and stroll. My time, how come? Came to Laisle Akira, Asl Nemebed Akira Vanacha. Well, because when he's just kind of strolling, it's, you know, when, when he's running, it's clear that he's on a mission, and he's running because he, you know, he's got to make sure not to do Akira and Anacha. Whereas if he's strolling, he might kind of space out and start and stop, and then he will be carrying for Amos. The Gemara says, 
to lo kai portav kamayal mishus harabim mishus ayachid. The Gemara says, I mean, that's awesome, and it's going to mamish take him like mamish to his house. But lemaisa, when he gets to his house, he's going to stop for a second. You know, unless the door is mamish wide open and he can run right into the house. If the door is closed, even even if it's unlocked, you know, he's going to stop for a second. You know, he's got to stop for a second, and once he stops. When he then goes into his house, he's going to have an Akira in Rosh Hashanah and Anacha when he gets into his house in Rosh Hashanah. So, you know, while running the entire time may avoid the issue of carrying for Amos in Rosh Hashanah, it's not going to prevent him from the uh, Malacha of Hachnasa. So, So, no, that he manages by um, kind of throwing down the item Yad. For example, he can like turn around and then just plop the thing off of his back rather than like taking it off of his back regularly. And therefore, I guess, since it's Kilach Hayyad, it's only also Midi Rabbanon. The Rabbanon said that in the place of Hefzid Mamon, such as he's got this backpack full of stuff that we don't want it, that he's not going to want to lose, well then I guess they would say that that would be acceptable. Okay? Amar Rami Barchama says, Rami Barchama, Hamachamer, Achar Behemto B'Shabbos B'Shogeg Chayev Chadas B'Mezid Chayev Skila. Interesting. So it says Rambam Barachama, if you have a fellow and he's got his donkey and his donkey is carrying some stuff for him, right? Now, of course, we've been saying that that wouldn't be allowed on Shabbos, right? Your donkey is not allowed to carry things for you on Shabbos because just like I'm not allowed to carry on Shabbos, my donkey is not allowed to carry on Shabbos. So what if you have your donkey and your donkey's got stuff on it and you're just kind of like whistling to it? You're just kind of whistling to indicate to your donkey that it should start moving. So you're not actually doing anything, but you're kind of just whistling and that you know, gets the donkey to start moving. So if you do that, it's called mechamer, so kind of escorting your donkey on Shabbos that is laden with stuff. So if you do it by accident, you're going to be chayv a korban chatas. If you do it on purpose, you chayv skila. Just like it's a regular melacha. My timer, how come this is the case? Well, Amar Rabba, Dhamar Kra, Rabba says, well, the Pazak says, lo sai se melacha ato vemtecha. Do not do melacha. And that applies to you, and it applies to your animal. So, Behemto Dumididei, therefore his animal is just like him. Mahu Bishogeg Chayev Chatas, Bemezid Chayev Skila, just like if he would do Melacha, so by, and by accident he would be Chayev Korban Chatas, on purpose he would be Chayev Skila. Ah, Behemto Nami Bishogeg Chayev Chatas, Bemezid Chayev Skila. So, therefore, the same thing applies to his animal as well. If he is Mechamer, if he whistles to his animal to, to get the animal to start carrying stuff, well, then, if it's by accident, he's going to be chayev a korban chatas. If it's on purpose, it'll be chayev skila. Amar Rava, shte tshuvas bedaver. Rava responds to Rava with two kashas. Chada, question number one. Dichsib, it says in the context of a korban chatas, and we've seen this before, that we learned korban chatas from Avodah Zara. Right? It says, Torah achas yelachim la'osa bishkaga, that it will be one Torah for, 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 for you, for anybody who does, who does it in, a, right, a maise by accident, and any soul that will do, you know, avodazara biad rama. So we compare the korban chatas by avodazara to the korban chatas by kola torah kula, in, including, um, uh, the korban chatas associated with melacha and shabbos. So huksha kola torah kula la avodazara. So we compare, um, all uh, of the Torah to Avodazar. Mavodazar David Maise Begufe, Achanami Ad David Maise Begufe. So just like by Avodazar, he does something with his body, Imamish does something to service the Avodazar. So here also, in order to be Chayev a Korban Chatas, you have to do something. Here he's not doing something, he's whistling. Whistling isn't doing anything. It's not a Malacha. He's not doing a Malacha. And therefore, Rabba sa- Rava says, it doesn't make sense to say that he would be Chayev a Korban Chatas for Mechamer since he's not actually doing anything. The Ode. And next question, um, Rabbi Bachama, you said that for Mechamer, if he does it on purpose and there were witnesses, he'd be chayiv skila. Tanan, we learn in a Mishnah in Sanhedrin, in Sanhedrin, in the parak of Arba Misa's Bezdin, where they talk about the different kinds of capital punishment. So in discussing um, who would get skila, um, it says in the Mishnah, Mechal es ha-Shabbos, it says here skila, but the Mishnah over there says karis, and there's a different gears here that changes it to karis. I'd prefer to read it like that since that's what it says in the Mishnah in Sanhedrin. So it says, um, an example of somebody who's chayav, uh, skila is somebody who's mechalal Shabbos in a situation, in a context where he'd be chayav a korban, 
chatas on by accident, and if he does it on purpose, he'd be chayev kares. So if he is warned, if there are witnesses, well then he will be chayev skila. Michlal di kamidi the ain chayev and ashik gosu chatas blaz dono skila umay niu lav de mechamer. So Rava says, look, the the Mishnah says over there in Sanhedrin that who is chayev skila. Right? So one of the examples is somebody who's Michal Shabbos, but not just Michal Shabbos, Michal Shabbos regarding a Melacha that by doing it by Bishogeg you'd be Chayav of Korban Chatas and Bemezid you'd be Chayav Karis. Implying that there are, are ways to be Michal Shabbos in a way that you wouldn't be Chayav of Korban Chatas, Bishogeg and Chayav Karis, Bemezid. So we want to say, what's this Melacha? It's got to be something. So let's say it's Mechamer. That when you aren't actually doing the Malacha, and you're not actually doing it in action, you're just kind of whistling to your animal and the animal is doing the Malacha. So let's say that, right, right, that the Mechamer is the example of something that you would not be Chayev, a Korban Chatas, Bishogeg, and Kariz, Bemezid, and therefore you wouldn't be Chayev, Skila. And therefore, how could Rami Barchama say that you're Chayev, Skila for Mechamer? Mistama, Mechamer is what the Mishnah is sort of the exception to the Mishnah in Sanhedrin. And by Mechamer, you would not be Chayev Skila. So the Gemara says, Lo. No, Mechamer is not the exception to the Mishnah in Sanhedrin. Tchumen valibud Rabbi Akiva vavara libud Rabbi Yossi. The examples that are excluded from Skila are Tchum uh, Shabbos, according to Rabbi Akiva. That according to Rabbi Akiva, Tchum Shabbos is Mida Araisa. It's like the 40th, 40th Melacha, so to speak. It's Mida Araisa, but you would not be chayv skila for it. Well, you would not be chayv uh, korban chatas. You would not be chayv karis mistama, and um, or at least you're not chayv korban chatas. And um, you also wouldn't be chayv skila. And also, according to Rabbi Eliezer, it's where right, havara lelav yotzas, right? That havara, you're not chayv to bring korban chatas. If you do havara, uh, it's only a lav. So uh, these are things that you would not be chayv skila for. However, we respond to Rava and say that you would be chayv skila for mechamer. However, his first question about how can you be chayv a korban chatas for mechamer, you didn't do anything, that still stands against Rav Barachama. And on Dav Kuf Nundalid, we're going to continue trying to understand um, Rami Barachama and what the implications of mechamer are. Friends, that was Dav Kuf Nun Gimel of Mesech the Shabbos. Let us do a review. So at the beginning, we started with some agaditas about death, just to kind of finish up what we started the past two days. Then we um, finished the 23rd parak of Masechta Shabbos and began the 24th parak of Masechta Shabbos, the parak of Mi Shehichshich, and it is the final parak of Masechta Shabbos. We talked about traveling. Friday, what do you do if you're, if you're traveling um, on Friday afternoon and it's beginning to get dark and you have your wallet with you? So... If there is a non-Jewish person there, you can ask him to carry it for you. If there's no non-Jewish person there, then put on your donkey. If you don't have a donkey, then give it to a shota. Um, what if there's no shota, but there is a cherish and a katan? So then, um, according to Abeliezer, you should give it to the child, because the child is certainly not chayv mitzvos. And if there's no child, then you can give it to the cherish, to the deaf person. If, uh, according to the rabbis, however, um, it's inconclusive uh, you know, both a cherish and a katan are not chayv mitzvah, so it's, in, you know, it, it, it's unclear who you should prefer to give it to, okay? Um, and there's an additional option, which is that if none of these other options are available to you, you can walk uh, in increments of less than four amos at a time. Uh, then we talked about how exactly can you put your wallet on your donkey, because after all, your donkey has to rest on Shabbos. So if Adabar Barahava suggests that, well, you just have the donkey start moving and put it on the donkey's back while the donkey's moving so the donkey is not doing any Akira. Rav Papa says that any, he says kind of a general rule, which is that something that if I do it by myself, I'll be Chayav a Korban Chatas. If I split it with my friend, it'll be Asim Yidrabanan. But if I split it with my donkey, it'll be Mutter. Um, we said that if you are by yourself on Erev Shabbos and it's getting dark and you have a backpack, what you should do is you should just sprint all the way home. And then when you get to your house, just kind of knock off the bag from your back um, sort of in a irregular way. And that would be a way to uh, um, take this thing home without violating any, violating any of the orises. 
And then we talked about at the end, Mechamer, escorting your animal on Shabbos, according to Rambam Barachama. If you do it Bishogeg, you're Chayv a Korban Chatas. If you do it on purpose, then you are Chayv Skila. Rabbi explains that this is because the Pasuk says, Lasasa kol melacha, ato vin chavitecha, avd chava amos chavem techa. Right, that you can't do melacha, your animal can't do melacha, just like you'd be chayav a korban chatas b'shogeg and skila b'mezid. Same thing applies to mechamer. Rav asks two kashas. He says, first of all, in order to be chayav a korban chatas, you have to do something. Here, it's just whistling, potentially. And the other kasha was that there is an exception to the Mishnah in Sanhedrin that talks about who is chayav skila, um, and we want to say. Right, for Chilol Shabbos, so we want to say that Machamer is the exception to the rule. To which the Gemara says, no, that's not a good proof. The exceptions would be Truman according to Rabbi Akiva and Avara according to Rabbi Yossi. Friends, that was Daf Kufnun Gimel. I hope you enjoyed. Have a great day. Peace out.